One thing that is also probably worth talking about, given um, how um, fashionable it has become to uh, equate British social anthropology with handmaiden of colonialism, um, uh, the role of government anthropologists, particularly in Africa. There is a chapter of our book called Old Africa Hands, uh, which is in part about the dialogue between the government anthropologists who were there uh, to help indirect rule, governing through the native authorities, uh, be more efficient, and the colonial administrators. And if you look at many of the reports of government anthropologists, particularly people like Northcutt Thomas, and um, in one case where he was called in as an advisor, Malinowski, the government anthropologists um, certainly could be somewhat patronizing. Uh, they didn't question the colonial project as such. After all, they were working for the colonial project. These are things you have to say. But on the other hand, they uh, tended to advise the administrators to be somewhat tolerant of things like polygyny, um, premarital sexuality, um, dancing that um, sometimes involved nudity, um, initiation rituals. Um, in other words, they did advise, shall we say, let up on these guys a bit. Um, they're not um, licentious, wicked savages, and you're going to make things harder for yourself if you try to um, eliminate all of their customs. Um, North Thomas um, in Nigeria, um, in one case, even went a little further, in which he said that uh, prostitution um, in Nigerian cities was not the result of the sexual proclivity of Nigerians, but the conditions created by the colonizers. Um, so that if you look at some of the things that the government anthropologists wrote, um, yes, nowadays it will seem patronizing, uh, it will seem tolerant of colonialism, but then if you look at the people they were advising and what the people they were advising, the real colonialists made of it, you can have a certain amount of sympathy for these guys. Uh, Northcutt Thomas uh, is described as um, a, crazy ve a crazy vegetarian who wears sandals. That's how the colonialists uh, looked at him. And, um, in the Rhodes House Library in Oxford, I was looking for um, records from the colonial anthropologists, and I came across um, a document that I could not have imagined existed, or I suppose I could have imagined it existed, but I could not have imagined that anybody as late as 1960 would deposit in a library open to the public um, of with a collection of her husband's papers, that anybody would not have had enough shame to hide this darn document as late as 1960. And this was a diary kept by the wife of uh, a Mr. Falk, whose role had been to put down the Igbo women's revolt in 1929. This was a revolt against a census being conducted among women um, that the women believed, rightly or wrongly, was going to be used to tax them as well as the men. And there were riots, there were some villages burned, there were some traditional shaming of women coming into uh, district offices and bearing their buttocks. Um, and this uh, frightened the authorities, and the riot was rather brutally put down. And 
um, Falk was in charge of putting it down. And while he was off putting down the Igbo Women's Rebellion, his wife was keeping a diary. And uh, the diary uh, talked about how we all keep our spirits up by playing tennis and having tea. We must not let the side down. Um, some remarks about how the educated native is among the worst, uh, that some of the uneducated natives at least um, have a kind of naturalness to them, but the educated natives have all of the dissipation um, without any naturalness to them, and these are the ones we have to watch for. And um, a particularly horrible little passage where she talks about a rhyme going on about Daddy, who was in the process of burning down villages to stop the riot, and she thought this poem terribly clever. A, a village a day, that is a village burned down a day, keeps the riot away. I mean, this was the most unbridled, racist, um, absolutely not caring about any feelings of the people being governed I have ever seen. And as late as 1960, this woman was quite happy to put this diary um, in the Rhodes House Library as opposed to burning it so nobody would find out what she and her husband were like. When her husband um, was rotated out of this post, uh, the local authorities had um, a um, reception for them at which, among other things, they praised Mrs. Falk for her wonderful work in teaching uh, Igbo ladies needlework. Mrs. Falk has an entry in her diary about an African dance which uh, reminds one of things written by explorers in the 19th century, such as uh, uh, Samuel Baker, uh, uh, and Harry Johnston. You know, gyrations. Uh, uh, gyrations, uh, improper movement of the, of the naughty parts of the anatomy, and wild sexual display, uh, all written in a very contemptuous language. And while by this time no anthropologist is writing like this, the stereotypes have persisted the old anthropology books remain. And in 1989, all of this is picked up here in the province of Ontario by a South African-born psychologist at the University of Western Ontario called J. Philippe Rushton, who shortly thereafter assumes the presidency of the U.S. based, of the U.S. based foundation, the Pioneer Foundation, which carries forward neo-Nazi ideas into the 21st century. But uh, if you look at Mrs. Falk's diary alongside uh, some of the things the government anthropologists were writing about needing to be uh, somewhat tolerant of polygyny, uh, you perhaps might um, at least a little bit revise your dismissal of the government anthropologists and in some cases all the British social anthropologists in Africa as handmaidens of colonialism. There was a difference and the real colonists uh, tended to discount what the anthropologists had to say anyway. There rarely were the, some of the anthropologists were colonial in their attitude and Evans Pritchard certainly was. And Max Gluckman, who was expelled, was certainly not. Because one was a conservative and the other was a member of the Communist Party. And there's a little difference. And uh, we might say that, of course, sexuality was revived as a field of study in anthropology, mainly in the 1970s, uh, with a few adumbrations in the 1960s. But when it came back, it wasn't just a study of people abroad, but also of people at home, and of a community uh, where it was mainly a study by, by gays, of, ga of gays, in our own communities and elsewhere. So anthropology comes home, quite literally, and 
it is, in a certain sense, more self-reflexive. It brings it, the notion of plur of culture in the plural to sexuality. Uh, Mead and Malinowski had correct. brought the notion of culture in the pl of culture in the plural to heterosexuality. They had argued there was no such thing as primitive sexuality, but basically they talked about heterosexuality. Um, but, and both of them, oddly enough for me, given what we now know about our own life, both of them argued that where there was um, freedom for heterosexuality, homosexuality didn't rear its head. Um, Benedict tried to uh, be a little bit more open, um, and of course in her own life much more so, uh, but um, neither of them, none of them really looked at homosexuality as a plural concept, although Benedict did a little bit. And several kinds of gay community. And um, the big thing that came out of the revival of homosexuality as a topic of study uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, Gilbert Hart, Stephen Murray, Esther Newton, uh, Gail, Rubin. Gail Rubin, is the idea that homosexualities are what we have to study. And also um, the idea that there are more than two genders. Um, all of these notions that are now very much with us um, really came out uh, in that anthropological work in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And one of the things we noticed, uh, and this is a big change even since we published Irregular Connections, and it was a big alteration we had to make when we did a reader for Wiley Blackwell, is the new anthropology of sexuality or sexualities was largely, though not exclusively, an anthropology of homosexualities or an anthropology of same-sex sexualities, depending on your terms of preference. But there was very, very little about the comparative anthropology of heterosexuality. Which Foucault would have predicted, where he said that the uh, copulating heterosexual couple is the one thing you're not allowed to speak about. Now, and but, but that began to change uh, with the sort of collections on African uh, 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 love and marriage published by Holly Wardlow and Associates and it also some of the Daniel. remarkable work of Rachel Spronk uh, or Spronk uh, in the Netherlands which well, is on she worked in Kenya she uh, worked in Kenya she's based in the Netherlands her works in Kenya where, where her work is on Ke uh, uh, Kenyan, the, uh, the sexuality, sexuality of, of young Kenyan urban lady. professionals in Kenya. And so that, 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 that is changing. And uh, is there still a conscription going on? Uh, well, certainly, uh, you can see, I mean, there aren't any colonialist agendas being advanced anymore. Uh, I would say that there has been a certain tendency uh, to find gays in other societies in order to justify being gay in our society because uh, if you could show it exists elsewhere, then it's kind of natural. There's always this search in the anthropology of sexuality in a discipline that supposedly abhors nature and prefers culture, there's always a, a search for the justification in what is supposedly natural, where, while denying that that exists. Is that fair? Or if you can't show what is natural, I think now it's more to argue there that uh, nothing is natural. That nothing is natural. Uh, except that is not uniform because um, the reaction to Foucault has been very mixed. Some of the uh, contemporary anthropologists of same-sex um, eroticism um, like Foucault, others loathe Foucault. And of course the debate as to whether um, 
sexual orientation is innate or learned um, is as much present within that community as it is in society at large, although it's used in different ways. I, I can never quite understand quite the vehemence of some of the reaction to Foucault, even from friends of ours. Uh, I mean, one friend uh, blamed him for all of postmodernism and post-structuralism. Which, which are was, not seen as good things. Uh, which were not seen as good things. Uh, uh, another person we knew uh, said that he was responsible for the persecution of right-wingers in universities. Uh, he has been publicly excoriated within anthropology as being responsible for the turn away from the study of innocent facts and the study of culture towards the study of power. And everything is reduced to power, which is a bad idea, supposedly. And, you know, it's all a version of what happened in the newspapers in uh, fr France, the right-wing newspapers that proclaimed his death with headlines like the pervert has died. Uh, and I even when our first work came out, we sent it to a very well-known figure in the historian of, sec uh, historian of sexuality who is not Regner Darnell, but a very well-known figure uh, in the US who said uh, that I understand he's into leather. And I think his importance is totally exaggerated. As though in some way uh, his supposed uh, predilections as a leather man entirely diminished his intellectual contribution and made it suspect. Actually, I do have an explanation for why. And you have to look at what greeted Freud. In some ways, they're an inversion of each other. Freud went into a society where people congratulated themselves on being very cerebral and told them, actually, underneath all of your morality, underneath all of your philosophy, is your body. Uh, you may have sublimated it, but your body is there. And we sort of got used to that. And now along comes Foucault and starts telling people, all of these things you think are coming from your body, all of these needs you think you have in your body are really just coming to you from the power structure. <laughs> so that um, he's the inverse of Freud, and it's just as threatening. Uh, you tell people that their mind is really governed by their body, that's threatening. But then you tell people, hey, your body is really governed not by your mind, but by the mind of a bunch of bureaucrats who organize your school system, <laughs> organize your hospitals, that's also threatening. Yeah, but, but, but you see, what Freud refers to as socialization and repression and, the for, and superego formation, Foucault calls subjectification. Exactly. But in fact, they're not that far apart that way now, are they? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, Foucault... Um, well, I don't think Foucault would ever have denied that somewhere, somehow, there is something biological in desire. Certainly, um, he definitely would have said that the form your desires take are amazingly dictated by society. Yeah, I think that and if your whole life is to fight for the legitimacy of your desire, and you're told hey, wait a minute, your desire is socially constructed. And then there's also the issue with, well, if that's the case, um, maybe it's legitimate to pass laws against it. Uh, if it isn't something you can't help, maybe it's legitimate to pass laws against it. I think a lot, though, of what's happened with Foucault is he's been read by Americans. Yeah. Uh, uh, by that, I mean that Americans are not trained in sense of irony, academically. And that the history of sexuality, volume one, is dripping with irony. And that a lot of people don't get the irony. So, uh, so Foucault is not saying 
the Victorians uh, were people who allowed anything sexual to happen. He's, He's saying that they were forced to talk about it all the time in order that the power structure could manipulate it. Yeah. Uh, but but the, the, the other thing is that American extreme constructionists have made Foucault into an extreme. extreme constructionist, where I don't think there is evidence that he was that extreme a constructionist. He wasn't interested in what was natural. That's different from saying there isn't anything underneath. I think he assumes that what is natural is a constant and therefore not interesting. Correct. He isn't saying That's it isn't there. Saying. He's saying it's a constant. That's what I'm getting at. Uh, so, you know, that's some of the stuff we've been doing. We thought we'd get away with it. After all, we're nearly dead. At least I am. And you think you can get away from sex when you're nearly dead. Uh, people will stop bothering you. <laughs> uh, uh, unfortunately, we spent most of our lives as teachers. And although the Nigeria research didn't do us any harm, the only hit we ever had uh, in terms of research was in 2004 when we were nearly senescent but it had taken us so long to write it and one thing I have to say you know we're talking anthropology we're talking research there are very different careers for the, per for the people who through their own fault or through bad luck have ended up in teaching institutions and that those of them who have spent their lives in research institutions, possibly because you did very good field work early on, and possibly through self-confidence, do not realize what it is to be in the institutions which primarily focus on undergraduate education, because... Or being in any institution in the precariat. Or, or which we are not in. We we're at not. least did, were not in the generation which put in the precariat. We have a young friend now with a superb P PhD based on research in Senegal who is trying to get her first job and finding so far no bites. I had a student who was brilliant. We expected great things of her. She finished her PhD at the beginning of the job glut. She went through 20 temporary jobs before she finally got a permanent job in a community college. And this is the most horrible story I have ever heard of in academia. Uh, she got tenure on Monday and died on Thursday. Not this Thursday, but the week she died, she got tenure on Monday. Someone came into the hospital to tenure, tell her she got tenure, and on Thursday she died. And we've got and lots of young friends suffering this including one who was nominated for an award, a Teaching Scholar Award, at the institution I taught at, and at the moment is part of the precariat. And, uh, but I would say that the one thing that's in common is that we share in common with them, but to a lesser degree. Some of them can't do any research at all. But we had one-third to one-half the research time we would have had if we had been at institutions which valued research more than uh, art. And it was particularly true of me, because the University of Waterloo is more of a research institution, uh, though its main focus is science. But uh, we were both there for a while at Laurier, and I'm sure it teaches, it's a reasonably good teaching institution, but you have less time for your research. And that was true of the institutions we taught at previously. And if there's a lesson, get, make sure you have a good field site straight away and get as much as possible published before you ever get on the market. And realize you may never have an opportunity like that for field work again. And you really have to apply yourself, your those early years, which we to a degree didn't, we played around too much, uh, 
otherwise you'll pay for it the rest of your life. And, it, and that sounds too negative because I really enjoyed the teaching, but I'd have enjoyed it if I could have balanced it more with research so that instead of teaching other people's anthropology, I could have taught a bit more of my own. I have to say that it's a matter also of rigid organization. My friend Matthias Gunther taught at the same institution and managed to publish like crazy through the most incredible discipline and having done outstanding fieldwork as a grad student among the sand and continuing that fieldwork in summers whenever he could get back. But you've got to be very disciplined.